Hey, this is Pastor Nick coming to you from First Church of the Nazarene inside the Poe Chapel. I, I'm excited to bring this message to you today, but I usually am. And that's not just something I say. That's not a, a story I'm making up. I really love doing this, and I hope that it's uh, just ministering to your spirit. But more than that, I pray that this, is, this series especially is helping to form you into a disciple of Christ. We've been looking at what it means to be a disciple of Christ as we've been going through this, uh, this series called the uh, Encountering Jesus series, going through the life and the times and the culture of Christ the Messiah. As we've been looking at these things, I've, we're, we're, we're looking at the background around the stories in Scripture. And it brings them alive. It brings life to them. It, it helps us to see what Jesus was doing, what he was what his goal was, what he was hoping, or, or not just hoping, but was accomplishing. And so I pray that as you follow along, as you study the scriptures on your own, that you would be transformed by them, ultimately transformed by Jesus Christ himself and made into one of his disciples as well. We've talked about that word Talmud, a disciple. Talmudim is the plural. And uh, my goal in this and my goal in ministry in the church is to make Talmudim of Jesus Christ. To, to help form you into one of his disciples. Today we're looking in Matthew at the end of chapter 4 and in chapter 5 with something that's called the Beatitudes, which means the blessings. And each one is blessed are those, blessed are you. And we'll look at what Jesus meant by those things, but at the, every time I study these, I see that they build on one another. It's almost like a ladder going up. And it's like Jesus is, is giving us the bottom rung all the way to the top rung in the Christian life as a disciple of his. And so as we look at these things and as you open up your scriptures to follow along in, in Matthew there, chapter 4 and 5, uh, I, don't, I hope that you're not just following along. I hope that you're not just listening to me. I hope that you're not just kind of checking off the box and moving on from here. No matter what age you're, you are, no matter how long you've been a Christian, the in truth, the goal of this is that you would become more and more like Christ, and not just that and stopping there, but that you would then turn and go and make more disciples. Because a rabbi like Jesus would always make disciples and then release them to go and make more disciples. And if you're not going to make more disciples, if you're not going to further the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, then you've missed the point on this Christian life. Because the point isn't just to save you so that you're saved. Jesus' goal in saving you was so that you would go and reach others with this gospel, with this good news of Jesus Christ, that they too might become a disciple of his, a follower of his. So I ask that you would open up your scriptures to Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. I'm going to say a word of prayer over you, and we're going to read this. God, we just thank you that we can be in this place that we're at this morning. Wherever it might be that we're watching this, Lord, I just pray that you would bless the one who's listening, the one who's following along, the one who's eagerly studying. God, I pray that you would help them to grow, help them to be closer to you, help them to be fit and ready for service in your kingdom, that they might have a burning passion and desire within them to share the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ with those around them. Lord, we thank you for these moments and this time. In Christ's name, amen. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 23, down through Matthew 5, verse 12. Jesus went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of disease and sickness among the people. So a report about him spread throughout Syria. People brought to him everyone who suffered with various illnesses and afflictions, those who had seizures, paralytics, and those who were possessed by demons. And he healed them. And large crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region beyond the Jordan River. When he saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. After he sat down, his disciples came to him, and then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things about you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, because your reward in heaven is great. For they persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. I, when I read that from Jesus, I almost want to say, Jesus, that's not very comforting. Just because someone else was mistreated doesn't mean that I should be happy about it. But he's saying, if that happens, you're in good company. The great men of old, the great prophets of God were mistreated horribly. And so if you are mistreated for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ, then you should rejoice and be glad because you've been found worthy of being held in the same honor as his prophets. Now, if we're reading this, I, there's, you know, there's a reason I went back to Matthew chapter 4. So many times it gets difficult to just read and study something based on some numbers. You know, chapter 5 or verse this or verse that. Sometimes we need to kind of get rid of those. I love what Eugene Peterson did in the message translation because he eliminated the verse numbers. He left the chapter numbers in there so that we could, you know, still find the general area to read. But he took out the verse numbers so that we would just read uninhibitedly and just continue reading through the passage. So many times it, it kind of um, breaks up the flow of it when we get these little headings of a section, you know, the Beatitudes, salt and light, fulfillment of the law and prophets, anger and murder, adultery, divorce, oaths, retaliation. We take those things as if they're separate little sections like Jesus was just one day he said this, and another time he said that, and after lunch he talked about this. No, this was one sermon, one message that, that took uh, three of our chapters, chapter 5, 6, and 7, that Jesus speaks uh, this, this message, this sermon. Uh, this was at a time, and if you read, if you try to harmonize this with the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it gets a little difficult because so many of the details they tell are different. In fact, Luke doesn't have the same number of beatitudes. He has four blessings and four woes. And it's, it's kind of like um, a woe pronounced on those who don't do the last four things. So it's neat the way that Luke kind of flips it and inverts it and still says the similar or same message. But depending on where you're reading, it seems like this was right around the time, either just before or just after, Jesus uh, picks or, or calls 12 apostles. It seems like he's already called his disciples to follow him, but then he, um, he picks 12 out of the group of followers to be what's known as the apostles, or those who would later proclaim his ministry and his, his uh, resurrection and proclaim that before the world. But Jesus here, um, he begins this, this long sermon that takes three chapters and cut, it covers a whole bunch of different stuff. It touches on lots of things to do with life. In fact, if we probably spent all of our time just studying this Sermon on the Mount, we call it, this, you know, Jesus going on the mountain and preaching a sermon, if we just spent months studying that and living it, then we would probably be growing closer to Christ than ever before, living the way he called us to live, loving the way that he loved and called us to love. But here in, in this, uh, in this, you know, section we started in chapter 4 and continued through in chapter 5 because I wanted us to see this little bit of context. Jesus was going throughout all of Galilee. He's going through the region, uh, the, the part of the, um, country, the nation of Israel, the land of Israel that he was living in. You know, Nazareth, the town that he grew up in, was in Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is part of that, the north, uh, northeast corner of, of, Ga of the region of Galilee. And he went throughout there teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel or the good news of the kingdom. Now, what he was doing was fairly normal. As an itinerant rabbi or a traveling rabbi, he would go and take his, his Talmudim with him, his disciples. He would take his Talmudim with him so that they could see a variety of places, hear the word preached in a variety of settings. Any good preacher today, it, at least should endeavor or most do endeavor to understand their 
their audience, like who is listening to them and, and try to know their life, try to know how they live, what things are valuable and important to them, what things are going to be um, like key words that, you know, I think it gets a bad rap today. Uh, triggered is a, a thing that comes up today. But what things are going to trigger a certain image or thought in them? And should you use that image or avoid that image depending on who you're talking to? This is part of what it means to be a preacher. And it's kind of a difficult thing what I'm doing right now because I actually don't know unless you tell me you're watching this. Hint, hint. I don't know who's actually participating in these videos. So I can't figure those things out. So I preach a little bit broadly to whoever might be listening and I leave it up to the Spirit of God to speak to those who watch, to speak to those who listen. Well, Jesus was uh, in this tradition of itinerant rabbis. He was going around with his Talmudim, with his disciples, and preaching in different synagogues and teaching there. This was this was normal. This is what he did. In fact, the next thing it says is that he was healing all their kinds of diseases and sicknesses among the people. Now, this was also actually not, I'm not going to say common, but it was, it was something that he wasn't the only one that did that. There had been and were other rabbis who performed healings. But even though it had been done by other rabbis, pay attention to the things that Jesus did. He didn't just heal someone of an illness or a sickness, although he did those things. It says people brought to him everyone who suffered with various illnesses and afflictions, those who had seizures, paralytics, those who were possessed by demons, and he healed them. And large crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan River. Now, if we're paying attention to the things that Jesus was doing, each one of those was so that he could illustrate what life was like in his kingdom. This is what he was doing as he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's healing in accordance with the kingdom. In other words, in the, the new heavens and the new earth, if, we, if you've uh, watched our Revelation series from Sunday evenings, um, we, and if you haven't or don't know about it, send me a, a message or email me. Pastor Nick D. Ford at gmail.com, and I will send you the link. It's not a public link on YouTube. It's, been, it's private, but I can send it to you, and I'm happy to do so. Uh, but if you've been following along with that, we're building to a climax or pinnacle in that uh, study, and that's at the end of the book, the very end of Revelation and the end of our Bible, there's this new heavens and new earth that God has been preparing and it comes crashing down to our realm of existence, to, to the heavens and the earth that we dwell within. And everything is made new, and it's renewed, and it's better, and it's what God had intended. And in the midst of that, he wipes away all tears from our eyes, removes pain and suffering. There's no more death, no more sickness. So when Jesus comes proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, he heals people in accordance with that. He heals people in accordance with what life will be like in God's intended future. But so many times we wonder when we see some of our diseases and illnesses not healed by God, I think so many times it's because we don't understand why he wants to heal us. See, God isn't a God who just wants to make sure we never have any pain. Did you read that last thing that we saw? Uh, if, if people persecute you and say evil things about you, on account of him, falsely say it on account of him, then rejoice and be glad. In other words, you will suffer in this world if you are a follower of Christ, especially if you're a really good follower of Christ. And if that's the case, then if, if Jesus says that's going to happen, then why would he heal people? Why would we expect that there would be 100% um, pain-free on this earth? That's in the world to come. That's in the heaven to come. And so that's what Jesus is, that's why he is doing his healings. It's not just as a testimony of his power, although when you read the Gospel of John, he, he has different signs that Jesus performs that are made to show the power and authority of Jesus. But according to Matthew's telling of it, this is because uh, this Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom, and so therefore he's healing in accordance with what kingdom life should look like. And his fame begins spreading through Syria, which is kind of to the east of Israel. And his fame spreads to a people who are not Jewish, to a people who are not 
uh, the chosen people of God. In fact, as he healed all these people, it says that large crowds followed him from Galilee, which makes sense. Galilee is, um, it was the region that Jesus came from, and it was actually very rich in learning, in education. We're talking religious education here. They knew their scriptures very well, and they were very learned in them, and they spent a lot of time discussing and, and learning them. Uh, they, in fact, were very culturally experienced as well because of what we've talked about before, the Via Maris, the, the way by the sea, the highway that, that came up through the land and came through Galilee, actually went right next to Nazareth where Jesus lived, so he would have seen all the cultures of the world passing by. Uh, that road would have crossed over the Jordan River north of the Sea of Galilee, would have crossed over the river there, and um, uh, would have... Uh, you know, been just kind of a, a trading place for many cultures of the world and many merchants of the world. And so Jesus was very familiar with that, where he lived both as a young man and as a, uh, as a rabbi. The Decapolis, though, is another place that it mentions. Crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis. Now, Decapolis means the ten cities or the ten towns. And these were on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, on the other side of the Jordan River. And they were... Um, at least the Israelites believed they were where the seven pagan nations lived or were represented by. The seven pagan nations that had originally inhabited the land of Canaan, the promised land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And later, when, the, when Moses led the people of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses died, and then Joshua uh, led them into the promised land and God fought for them and drove out the nations from before them. There were, they believed, seven pagan nations that inhabited this, this land of Canaan or this promised land. And they got pushed out. And so the Israelites believed that they lived in this region called the Decapolis, the, the Ten Cities. Now, these would have been, um, these would have been a, at the time of Christ, a very Greek or Hellenized part of the world. They would have been something that, uh, was very, very influenced by Greek culture, starting from when Alexander the Great had been conquering these areas and, and attempting to exert Greek influence over, um, over this region. Um, he wanted to make every place he conquered Greek, Hellenized. And it worked really well. And so this is right next door to Israel. And since it's right next door to Israel, it'd be easy for, uh, for a young Jewish boy, say, you know, say maybe in Capernaum or in Bethsaida that were right around the Sea of Galilee, it'd be easy for them to maybe have business to do over there. Maybe fishermen who were selling their fish would, would catch them, they would prepare them, and then they would go and sell them maybe in a market in one of the ten towns in the Decapolis because it's nearby. And when they would do that, they would see the culture around them. They'd see the opulence. They'd see the, the marble in the streets. They'd see the fancy buildings. They'd hear the the merriment, the joy, the, the celebrations going on. They would also see the, the temples to the foreign gods, the false gods. They would see all these things. They would see the prosperity in those regions too. And it might be intriguing to some of them. It might be that some of them were uh, wanting to be part of that culture. The, the gymnasiums where people trained, where they competed, where they learned. That might be intriguing to them. The, the luxuries that abounded. And yet, uh, Jesus has now followers coming from there. Rather than people who are intrigued by that lifestyle and wanting to see what it's all about, now they have people from that lifestyle that want to see what Jesus is all about. Because he preached a rival kingdom to the one that they were part of. In fact, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a few different places in our New Testament where we see something that happened in this region. Just, just, uh, just today I was reading in my, uh, my Bible reading plan about uh, the time where Jesus actually went to one of these towns on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He crossed over, and there he found a man possessed by a legion of demons. This is the story where he actually uh, drove them into the herd of pigs. When Jesus drove the demons from this man into the herd of pigs, the man later, he wanted to, as he was clean and in his right mind and clothed once again, 
he wanted to follow Jesus. He asked if he could become a disciple of his, essentially. And Jesus told him no, but he says, go home to your town and tell everything that God has done for you. So the man eagerly went forth into the Decapolis and preached the gospel in his hometowns. This was a man who grew up in that. Jesus drove the demons out of him, cleansed him, and he went to his hometown and preached the gospel. I think it was the hand of God at work in this man's life, but I think it was also very symbolic what Jesus was doing. I'm not saying it was just a symbolic cleansing of demons. He really did that. But I think it was a symbol of what Jesus was doing as he was cleansing this man as a representative of those towns so that that man could then go and preach the gospel there. In fact, um, it's, it's very likely that, uh, that Jesus knew that this man would be a preacher. How could he not? How could he not go and share what he's done? And yet, doesn't God expect the same thing out of us? If Christ has made you free, you are free indeed. Now go, therefore, and share this good news with those around you. Another area that Jesus preached in and did these things was in the region of Jerusalem. Now this was the religious capital. It was where the temple was. This was where um, the, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the, the Sanhedrin were. This was where people were very intent on proper religious uh, devotion and, and, you know, proper traditions being employed. And Jesus would run into a lot of trouble with arguments in this place. The, the Pharisees was one of the groups that had very strict purity laws. Because of people like those that came from the Decapolis and other regions, they wanted to make sure that they maintained their purity. Just next to Jerusalem was what was called the region beyond the Jordan, and we'll talk about that in a second. They wanted to make sure that some of the excesses of that region didn't infiltrate them. So the Pharisees had seen some of the, the, the ways that they had gotten wayward before in the past as a nation, and they made sure that they were not going to get caught up in that again. So they created human traditions to maintain God's laws of purity. Now, on top of that, you had, um, you had the zealots who were actually militant. They were ready to fight the Romans and fight the Hellenized culture to push it out, to get rid of it. They were looking for someone that would stand up and lead them to, uh, to drive out this foreign influence on them. They were ready to fight. In fact, as the zealots were looking for someone that would rise up and lead them, the Pharisees were looking for someone who would rise up and be the model of purity. And they saw the signs that Jesus did, and yet when he wouldn't uh, when he wouldn't play by their rules, when he wouldn't force his disciples to wash their hands and wash all the cups and bowls so that they were ceremonially clean and, and ensured that there was no, um, no chance of impurity in them. When Jesus wouldn't play by their rules they had made up, they rejected him. Oh boy, this is fun. Jesus worked uh, in the midst of all those, and there was also the group of Essenes. Now the Essenes were the ones that withdrew from society and they wanted to get back to their spiritual roots. Then there was the region of Judea, which was the region around Jerusalem. There was still some wilderness in that area, there were, or not still some, there was a bunch of wilderness in that area. And that was kind of, you know, where some of the people came from in his ministry. And then the region across the Jordan, which was called Perea, P-E-R-A-E-A. -E -E and the Perean region was kind of south of the Decapolis, and it's where Jesus was um, working, uh, you know, in that area as well. And people were coming from there and, you know, coming to be part of his ministry. Jesus, uh, he didn't avoid these areas. He didn't avoid the pagan areas. He didn't avoid uh, the, the religious, you know, uh, zealot type folks. He didn't avoid the people who were syncretizing different cultures and religions. He didn't avoid the sectarians that set themselves apart. He didn't avoid all of that. He went and preached to all of them and called them all together. And he was the uniting force and factor in all of them. He called disciples from all these areas and walks of life. And he, he drew them to him and made them one homogenous group. He selected these 12 apostles and he made them, uh, you know, made them his his inner circle of 12 
and here he's preaching this full-length sermon to him. Before this, we see that he had preached in synagogues, but the only recorded sermon we have is, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. These beatitudes, or these blessings that were spoken to his disciples, assume that, um, that you know, if, if you're a disciple of, of Christ, you at least have somewhat of a relationship with God. He's speaking of the kingdom of heaven, and so if you're part of this, then you should understand that the kingdom of heaven is different from the kingdoms of this world. In fact, Jesus began preaching this when he saw the crowds. Now, these crowds came from different kingdoms. They came from the kingdom of Rome, this Hellenized culture. They came from the kingdom of Israel. They came from different ideologies within each of them, but the crowd still showed up to hear him and to follow him. And he, it wasn't that he just noticed them. It says when he saw the crowds. It wasn't just that he had just noticed them. It was that he saw them. He knew them. He understood them. He knew their way of life from traveling around and hearing from them. And typical of Jesus, he spoke directly to their spiritual condition. Now, the blessings, the Beatitudes begin and end at the same place. They begin and end with teachings on the kingdom of heaven. And and these uh, these. These things, these elements of what it means to be part of his kingdom, they stand in stark contrast to this world. I was reading a book by C.S. Lewis uh, just this week, and he pointed out the proper place for patriotism. Now, when he was writing, it was during a time of a world war. And he was, he was talking about should a Christian fight if they're called to service, and he believed that they should. But he said the proper place for patriotism is this. I will die for my country, but I won't live for it. In other words, uh, we're residents here of Earth in America, or he was talking about Great Britain, but we're residents of America, but we're citizens of heaven. Our residency is here, but our citizenship is in heaven. And so the beginner's guide to what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven is right here with his, these beatitudes. I'm going to assign a little homework to you. I want you to go through these and see which ones you are strongest in. I want to see which ones you, like, if this is a ladder of blessings, I want to see where you maxed out and where you have to grow. I think it'll be quite obvious when you see the Beatitudes as a ladder, you'll say, I haven't gone to that rung yet. I haven't gone up to that step yet. And so that is what you must do. That's where you must be. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Now, poor in spirit means that you're so, there's such a poverty of your soul, but such a spiritual poverty that you can feel it. Just like if you were physically poor and so hungry that you, that you felt like you couldn't go on, it's the same thing with this poverty of spirit. And until you feel that hunger, that poverty in your bones, you can't understand what it means to be part of the kingdom of heaven. Then the next one he says is blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And I wonder what did he mean that we're mourning about? You know, people mourn every day for, um, you know, for a lost loved one, a lost, uh, lost job, a lost, you know, some kind of comfort or some kind of thing that they've lost in life. And is that what he's talking about? I don't think so. I think what he's talking about is those who see and sense once they have once they have first stood on that first rung of the ladder to understand their spiritual poverty when they climb up to the next rung and realize that they are sinful that there's a sin problem inside their life and their heart that needs to be dealt with and then as God's dealing with that we look around and we see others in this world who who their sin is so uh, so damaging to them and is keeping them from Christ and all that he has for them we begin to mourn the sin of the world. But Christ says we will be comforted. Why? Because he came to deal with sin. The next one, the third ladder rung, is blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now the, the world, the people of this world, don't celebrate meekness. To be meek is, is being humble and submissive and unassuming, compliant, tame. These uh, people that fit that description aren't usually out seizing power in the world. They're not usually the ones that we're voting for, the ones that we're uh, seeing run, you know, some businesses growing rapidly and increasing their client base. We don't see meek people just seizing power on this earth. 
And yet, Jesus says that they are the ones who will inherit the earth. I think he's talking about the new heavens and the new earth. If you're meek here on this earth, if you're compliant and tame, that doesn't mean a pushover, and that doesn't mean not getting it done. It just simply means that you understand your place and your role that God has given you. The meek will inherit the earth to come. The fourth ladder rung is, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I've been hearing this since I was a little tiny boy. This was my mother's prayer constantly, was that we would, as her children, would hunger and thirst for righteousness, that we would hunger and thirst for for more of God. This one's about our desires. It's about the things that we long to consume. If, if we are longing to consume things like food, sex, relationships, wealth, experiences, joys and pleasures, thrills, relaxation, comfort and ease, whatever things it is that we are longing for, that's what we want our life to be filled with. And Jesus is saying that we need to be hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And that if we're doing that, we will find satisfaction in it. We will be filled. We will be satisfied because he is the one that satisfies. Hunger and thirst for the righteousness that Christ gives you. The fifth rung on the ladder is blessed are those who are merciful for they will be shown mercy. Mercy is not a virtue that's easily lived out. There's people that have desired righteousness uh, they've lived meekly after pouring, mourning over their sins and other sins. Uh, they've seen how poor they are in spirit. They've, they've, they've been through these ladder rungs. And once they hit that point, they seek to show mercy. Because it's in the mercy of God that we have been forgiven and healed and cleansed. When we realize that, we want to show mercy to others so that they too can be shown the mercy of Christ. So if you can show mercy to someone in a way that leads them to Christ, then do that. Then show it. The sixth rung, the sixth blessing is blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. If you've gotten to this point, to the point where you've hungered and thirst for righteousness, you've shown mercy to others, where you've mourned over the, the sin on this earth, where you've recognized your spiritual poverty, where, where you've uh, shown a a meekness about yourself is probably pretty obvious that you'll be pure in heart. Your heart will be not uh, filled with the, the darkness and the evils of this world, but it'll be filled with the purity of God. This is when we begin to see our hearts being made pure and cleansed. And, and once purity sets in, uh, it's, it's this uh, eye-opener where we begin to see God. At all times, we begin to see his work in action in all places. But not just that, um, our, our, we, we think so many times purity is religion or piety or something like that. But truthfully, purity is in our hearts. It's not necessarily visible outside except that we don't get messed up in the things of this world anymore. Number seven on the ladder is blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Now, this is the one where we begin to see that um, God, you know, is just everywhere. When, when, we, when we've got our heart purified by God and we begin to see him at work, now we want to see his peace spread throughout the entire world. So we, we see God's heart. We see God's love everywhere. We see a desire to bring peace because that's what Christ is doing. It's not just a peacemaker like between two parties that are arguing and we're the arbitrator in between them or the arbiter between them. This is the peace of God that, that God has made with sinners in a sinful world. His kingdom is a kingdom of peace and we want to see that peace spread. Number eight is blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Now, this is uh, starting or ending where it started. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. This, this Christian way of living, for some reason, is repulsive to the people of this world who are living in sin. For whatever reason it might be, to be a righteous person is fought against by the people that are part of the kingdoms and nations of this world. But if you're part of the kingdom of heaven, if you're part of God's kingdom, if that's where your citizenship is, then you will be looked down upon. You will be insulted, reviled, 
perhaps even persecuted. They might shun you, insult you, abandon you, and falsely accuse you. And if that's the case, be glad, because the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. In fact, Jesus wraps up, and we could say this is the top rung of the ladder. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil things about you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, because your reward is great in heaven. For they persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. You see, if you've gone through this Christian walk, this blessing ladder, if you will, then uh, you, you see that um, you're in good company. You see that, that uh, when, you, when you get persecuted by people who are living outside of Christ's kingdom, then you are in good company with God's servants who have gone before you. So rejoice. Be glad when this happens. Count yourself blessed to be able to, to uh, have these things happen to you on account of your righteousness. History is full of others who have been similarly mistreated and persecuted. You're in great company. I want to close with this. Our citizenship is, is different than the people of this world and the residents of this earth. Our, allegiant, our allegiance is to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And our call is to spread his fame and glory and to call others to come to Jesus. I, I believe that we need to have this as a bit of homework for us to go through these nine ladder rungs and see where you end up. In fact, you could even rate yourself one to 10 on each of them, take them one at a time and say, you know, where are you? One is barely or 10 is I'm all the way there and see where your progression stops because I believe it grows over time and I believe you should be progressing through these blessings. See where God has, has brought you, but don't stop there. Continue climbing through this because he will never leave you uh, stranded. He will always keep carrying you higher. Let me know how I can help you with that. We've got things that we can do. Just know that discipleship can't happen 100% sitting in a church or watching a video. You have some, some responsibility on your own to do as well. Let me know how I can help you with that and lead you closer to Christ.